What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and be seated. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> before he gets away, I want to say, are you not thankful for how we sing scripture? I mean, Zion does a great job in leading us. And brother, I mean, this is not about Zion, but I do want to thank him for what he does. I also want to say that song, uh, Shepherd and Shelter, he was one of the guys that wrote that. This is, this is the depth. I mean, obviously David wrote it it's right, straight from the scripture. But he kind of took it and was a part of that. Zion, thank you, man. That's a good brother right there, and I appreciate the way that he leads us each and every week. Uh, you've got your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 11, we're continuing in the Hall of Faith. Uh, we're walking through this chapter as we are, have been looking at the Old Testament saints, and we're in a series called By Faith, and how these saints had a very sure belief. Look at Hebrews 11.1, 1, if you don't mind. Hebrews 11.1. 1. They had a sure faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. They were looking forward to a Savior. They didn't know fully about who Jesus was, but they heard God, they believed God, and they were looking forward, for they had a conviction. It says the conviction of things not seen. Though They had not seen their Savior yet. They trusted God. Remember, I've said this several times. You're going to hear it again. Uh, it's been six weeks. This is week seven. They not just believed in God. They then believed God and his word. They believed in God. God. They heard the word of God, the voice of God, and then they believed him and they acted on. James 1 tells us that you tell me you have faith without works. I'd say you're a liar. It's dead faith. So they believed in God and then they believed him and they followed him. This whole chapter here. Uh, talks about some of these Old Testament saints. You remember Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it is what? Yeah, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So all that Hebrews 11 is doing is it's taking these Old Testament saints and it's showing how they believed in God and then they followed after him. You had Noah we talked about. If you look, look, look over there at the beginning of chapter one, chapter 11, we talked about Noah and how Noah heard the voice of God to build an ark. Here's one who had never seen rain fall from the sky. The ground had always been watered. Build this big boat. He built the boat. He believed in God and then he obeyed God. He believed God at his word and he built the boat. And the scripture tells us that out of that obedience, not, not because he acted, but because he believed God and, and followed God's voice, it says there was a covenant that, that was made. And, and the Lord told Noah, never again will I destroy the earth by a flood. Uh, we saw where Abraham, Abraham, who was a pagan living way, way away in the Ur of the Chaldees, Chaldeans, and he heard the voice of God. The, God spoke to him. He didn't follow God, but the one true living God spoke to him. He believed in God, and then he believed God. He left. What did God tell him to do? He said, go to a land. I'm going to show you where it is. You're no longer going to live with your family. He went to that land. He was believing God for a promised land. He, the scripture even says in chapter 11 that he never built a city, that he lived as in a tent and as a nomad, looking forward to the promise because the promise was God told him, I'm going to make out of you, Abraham, all the nations. You're going to have a child and out of you, I'm going to build a nation and I'm going to bless all of the nations through you. Your, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Uh, we know that he believed him and that was a covenant covenant, God's promise. In fact, in Hebrews 11, if you were to go back, you know how I am with words, if you were to go back and count through, depending on your translation, the word promise, 
A promise, a covenant is a promise that God has made that he will never leave or forsake. That word promise, depending on your translation, is going to be somewhere between seven, eight, nine times you're going to see the word promise. That's very important. So God promised this covenant. Joseph, by faith, when he was the second in command, he knew, listen, we're going to be here for 400 years. Why did he know that? Because his father Abraham... Isaac and Jacob, they had said, listen, you're, there's going to be a period of time where you're going to be in a foreign land. You'll be exiled. Joseph looked forward and knew, okay, we're going to be here. He preserved the people. God preserved the people. And then by faith, Moses came. He heard the voice of God. You're going to go and you're going to let my people, you're going to go and you're going to take my people out of Egypt and you're going to lead them back to the promised land because of the covenant that I had made. You see, by faith... By faith. And so today, we're going to talk about King David, the greatest king that ever lived in the nation of Israel. We're going to talk about King David. But in the days of David, when he was a shepherd boy, in fact, why don't you turn over to the book of 1 Samuel? We're going to be in first. Our background passage today is 11, 32 through 34. And you're going to see today, just as 11, 32 through 34 said, that David is one who conquered kingdoms. He enforced justice. He is one who quenched the power of the fire. He escaped the edge of the sword. He became mighty in war and he put foreign armies. See, he fulfilled this. This is who David was, but in the day in which David was a small boy, he was the last child, the last boy of a man named Jesse. Jesse was a good Jewish man who loved God. He obeyed God. He believed in God, and he believed God. He obeyed his word. Jesse would have been one who would have taught his sons, David, about the covenant of Noah, the covenant of of Abraham. He would have taught him how by faith, all of these people had preserved a people for God. He obeyed. Well, in that day, Saul was the king. You see, Samuel, who we talked about last week, Samuel was a prophet, and there had been all of these judges who had been judging the nation of Israel, and the the, the nation of Israel came to Samuel, the prophet, and said, hey, we're tired of the judges. We want to be like the rest of the nations of the world, and we want a king. Give us a king. Samuel went before God, and, and God told Samuel, he said, Samuel, listen, you need to know they're not rejecting you and your word. They're rejecting me. Give them a king. Samuel anointed a king, a king named Saul. The scripture tells us that Saul was was a reluctant king, but he became the king. And he is described as being one who was strong, one who was tall, and one who is handsome. That's kind of like what most leaders want, what most people want. They want someone who goes, yes, when he walks into the room, everyone knows that's the leader. So that would have been Saul. He would have fit the bill for the king. But here's what else we know. Not only was he tall, not only was he handsome, not only was he strong, but he was prideful and he was foolish. He didn't believe God. He disobeyed God as a king. And the Lord God told Samuel, I've removed my hand from from Saul and we're going to anoint another king. I want you to go to the house of Jesse. So he goes, Samuel goes to the house of Jesse. And as he gets to the house of Jesse, he says, I'm here. Where are your sons? They call the sons and he begins to go down the line trying to figure out which one am I to anoint to be the king? Are these all of them? Because none of them are the ones he's asking himself. It's kind of getting awkward. Jesse says, no, there's one more. He is a shepherd boy and he's out keeping the sheep. He said, get him. We won't go anywhere else. We're not going to eat. We're not going to do anything until he gets here. David comes in and he looks at him. He says, this is the one, the Holy Spirit. This is the one. And he is anointed. He is anointed as the next king. Now, 1 Samuel 13, I'm going to do just a flyby here, and then we're going to camp down in a passage. 1 Samuel 13 tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. He was a man full of faith. And he was a man after God's own heart. David was the youngest of Jesse's sons. He was a strong young man. He wasn't just a small boy, but he... He was a young man. The scripture tells us that he, uh, in keeping the sheep, he had actually protected the sheep by killing a lion and a bear when they came to attack with his bare hands. This is a bad dude. 
He handled business. Uh, do you remember last week when we were talking about the enemy of God, the, the nation, the Philistines, and they would came and they took the Ark of the Covenant? Well, the Philistines and Israel, they went through many, many battles. And, and in this day, you would know, you, many of you have heard the, the story of David and Goliath, the giant. Well, there was a day at the Valley of Ella when the two sides, the Philistines and the nation of Israel, are camped on either side of the valley, on the valley. You know, an opposing army never likes to be going uphill in a battle, right? Well, both of them would, well, the Philistines would call out, Goliath would say, hey, why don't you send me your man? That's why they stood at sides. Let's, let's have just one person come out and do the battling. He was making fun of them. He was mocking their God. This went on for like 39 days. And on the 40th day, Joseph, I mean, excuse me, David shows up because Jesse has sent supplies. He sent a lot of supplies. If you went back and you added up the weight of the supplies, it was somewhere around 50 pounds. This wasn't like a small little nine-year-old boy with a slingshot. This is probably a teenager, maybe a 20-year-old, who is carrying the supplies. And the scripture tells us that he ran to them. He ran to them. That word is literally ran. Have you ever tried to run with a 50-pound pack? He ran to them. It says he dropped off the supplies, and then he ran to the front lines, and he says, why are you letting this giant do this? Who is going to stand for the Lord? This is a man who was full of faith. This was a man who believed God, and he was trusting in the faithfulness of God because he knew already that God had been faithful to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. He had been faithful to Noah. He had been faithful to uh, Joseph. He had preserved a nation. He was faithful to Moses, and when Moses took out all the Israelites and took them back to the promised land, the land that he promised that he would give, he knew, listen, God has been faithful. Why are we standing here and we're not doing battle in the name of the Lord. The Lord's going to be faithful for us. This is the David that we see. Now, you know the story. David takes the slingshot, five stones, pulls one out, nails him directly in, in the head. He falls down. He goes and gets Goliath's sword and chops his head off. Uh, well, the people go crazy. And David is brought into the house of Saul, the king, David is probably somewhere around 20 years old because we know that David became king when he was 30, when David was 30. So there's a 10-year period here where he is in the house of Saul. He's playing instruments. He's writing songs. He is soothing the king when the king uh, has uh, depression and anxiety. He, he, he proves himself to be a warrior, and he becomes uh, a, a mighty warrior in the, in the hands of Saul, in the, in the army of Saul. And the scripture tells us, I believe it's in 1 Samuel 17, that there was a song that the ladies would all sing. They would sing, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. And you can imagine the king, the leader, got ticked. He started getting furious. And here David goes from war hero to fugitive and goes on the run. And Saul continues to chase him. We don't know exactly how long it is, but somewhere in there, there's probably a 10-year period that he's in the house. He's running from it. He's in the house. He's running from Saul. But he remains faithful, even in times when he had the opportunity to kill Saul. He wouldn't because he knew that Saul was God's anointed man. Saul was God's anointed, and he would not put his hand. He remembered, Samuel anointed me by the hand of God to be the next king. So he wasn't going to touch the king because he was faithful. But Saul, remember, was foolish. He was foolish. He had already known the kingdom's been ripped. You won't continue in it. And the scripture tells us that there was a day when, da when Saul went out to ba do battle, he was killed and his son Jonathan were killed. And now David ascends the throne by the hand of God through the people to Jerusalem. He now is king. He's living in peace. Turn over to 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel is the story. 2 Samuel is a part of the story. 2 Samuel chapter 7, a very important chapter because here in 2 Samuel chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 7, we have the covenant that God makes with David. The God of covenant, the God of promises, the God who made a covenant with Adam and Eve, 
the God who made a covenant with Noah, the God who made a covenant with Abraham, is now about to make a covenant with David, a promise. 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 3 says this, now when the king, now when the king, that would be David, now when the king lived in the house of the Lord, lived in his house, and the Lord had even him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of, uh, uh, of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. David had had a change of scenery. He's now king, living at peace. They're in Jerusalem. David builds a house, a house of cedar. Now, in Bible terms, that means it was a nice house. It was a big house. It, was, it wasn't a house of mud. It wasn't a house of clay. This was a house of, st- uh, of stone and wood. It was a large house. And he goes to Nathan, the prophet. Nathan, the prophet, kind of like his pastor. He says, hey, listen, I want, now that I've got a house, I want to make a house for God. I want to build him a house. In fact, I'm going to start a building campaign, and I'm going to make the, the first donation. Like any good pastor, he would say, yeah, help me out here. If any of you'd like to follow behind that, you make sure and let me know. You can see me afterwards. I, we'll, we'll work something out. I mean, he, what he's wanting to do is good and right. I mean, listen, I, I want to help. He says, listen, the, the house of the Lord, where the presence, the ark, it's in a tent. Do you remember that in the Exodus? God told them, I want to be near you. My presence is going to be in the center of you. And I, I want you to build me a tabernacle, construct a tabernacle. God designed his own house. He says, I want you to do this. But here's what happens. Nathan, before his head is fully on the pillow asleep, the Lord speaks in verses 4 through 7. 2 Samuel 7, verses 4 through 7. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all the places where I've moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar. God sends a message to David through the hand of the prophet, and he says, listen, David, I don't have a housing problem. I don't, I don't need you to build me anything. In fact, I don't need you to build me anything. I'm about to build a house for you. I'm about to build a house. Now, did David do something wrong here? Is it like he is like uh, in sin Listen, how many of you have ever in right motive, right thinking, wanting to do something for the Lord, do you ever felt like, oh my gosh, I'm getting a, later you realize, oh, I got ahead of the Lord. I should, right, right idea, wrong timing, because I didn't hear the Lord directing me. Well, we're going to see some of that today in here. And there's three points that I've got for you today, and I'm going to move through them very fast, really quick. Here's what I want you to write down. Is This is the roadmap that I think we're going to see out of 2 Samuel 7. Number one, today, we're going to understand how real faith, people with real faith, they understand that God is sovereignly in control. God is in control. People with real faith understand and are grounded in God's covenant. They understand how we're grounded in God's covenant. And the last thing is, we're going to see how real faith reflects God's character. Real faith reflects God's character. Let's talk about understanding God's control. Verses 8 through 11 says this. And anyway, there are some things that I'm going to ask you to underline, circle, something. I've got these underlined and circled in my Bible. You'll just follow this. It says, remember, the Lord is speaking. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you, circled, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been, circle, I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make, circle, I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint, circle, 
I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Listen, here's what the Lord is saying to Nathan or to David through Nathan. Listen, David, I don't need you to do anything for me because I've already done it for you. I don't need you to make me a house. I'm making you a house. You see, God has been dwelling in a tabernacle all this time. David's wanting him to be near. He's thinking, David gets an upgrade. Hey, God needs an upgrade. You realize God already gave, God's the one that gave David the upgrade. You see, we can do nothing. We bring nothing to God except our sinful, dirty rags. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags in the presence of God. God is the one who was in control of all that has happened in David's life, all that had happened throughout the nation of Israel. God is the one who did it. Now, was David in the wrong for wanting to do something for the Lord? No, he wasn't in the wrong. It, what was wrong was he was running ahead of God. He was trying to get ahead of God. He was trying to make a way. And what we have to understand as followers of Christ, those of us who have surrendered our lives to God, we don't make a way for God. God makes a way for us. He is the one that goes before us. We don't go before him. And in my own life, when things have gotten, I'll use the word wonky, that's a little East Texas word. When things got a little wonky, what I realized is that I'm running ahead of him. I'm trying to make my own way when in reality, he's the one that paves the way. All of these people that we've talked about in Hebrews 11, they didn't make a way. It was God who made a way. You didn't make your way to God. You realized that God made a way to you. He found you when you were in your sin. David wasn't looking for God. You know what David was doing? David was in the pasture handling sheep. And he says, David, have you forgotten? You were in the pasture and I brought you from the pasture to be the prince and live in the palace. The one that you think you built, the cedar that you think you, do you realize I spoke the cedar into existence? Folks, I, I don't know about you. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what situation you're in. You may be in a celebrative situation. You may be in a horrible situation. There may be a financial situation. You may have just hit the lotto. If you did, we need to talk. You may be like in relationship deficit. I don't know, but I need you to know this. Where you are is by God's design and his purpose. You didn't get yourself where you are. He's got you there. So if you're right now going, God, do you realize where I am? God, do you know? God, what have I done? I have tried to. Listen, it's none of that. This is God's sovereign control that you're where you are. And you in that moment know this. As a follower of his, who is, uh, you're under his covenant. He has saved you, not because of anything you've done, but because of everything Jesus has done. He knows where you are by design and you can stand and go, God, I, I don't know, but I know you're, you're here. In this place, this is where I am and I trust you. I trust you. You see, what ends up happening, what ended up happening with David is David was trying to change God's circumstances and God says, no, 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 wait a minute. You're, you're trying to get up on the throne. This is reserved for me. I'm here to handle you, to make a way for you. He's reminding David in here, David, you're not in control of you. I am. That ought to be something that brings comfort to you and me today, to know that God is near us where we are. David was trying to bring and I, I really believe this. I think David was trying to bring God into the city to be near him, thinking if we move the, temp, move the tabernacle in, do you realize that God is never far from you? He is always with you. The Holy Spirit of God resides in you. you. There is no place that you can go to get away from him. There is no place that you can be, nowhere that you can hide, nowhere that you can run, no situation that you're in, that as a follower of Jesus Christ, his eyes are not on you. That ought to be a word for you and me also. 
That no matter how far we run from him when we're trying to get away from him, that he sees and knows where we are because we are his children. And he will not leave us. He will not leave us. So David is seeing here, God is sovereignly in control. He's in control of my situation. He's the one that put me here. And, and real people of real faith live by faith knowing that God is in control. The days that I'm in, he knows what they are. The things that I'm wanting out of, he's there with me. And I, I want you to know, I want you to know, just like these Old Testament saints of faith, he may not pull you out of it, but he will walk with you through it. He will shut the mouth of lions, the scripture tells us. He, will, they'll be, he may quench the fire. The medical situation that you're walking in, he walks with you through that. The financial situation that you're in, he walks with you through that. So often we think if we get an upgrade, man, if I could get a bigger house, well, I'd, serve, I'd be able to serve the Lord well. I could have Bible studies over. If I, had more in, if I had more education, I'd really be a good teacher then. Then I could like start discipling people, jump in with students or start teaching adults. Man, if I could get a raise, then I could start being more and more generous with, with what God's given me. But do you realize what God, the situation and place you're in today is where God wants you to serve him today because he has created where you are and he desires you to be faithful in that very situation, right where you are, that you will, by faith, say, God, you've always been faithful, so I'm going to trust your faithfulness. Number two, not only do they recognize that God is in control, people who walk by faith are grounded in God's covenant. Verse 12 through uh, 13 say this, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down, that would be die, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, notice another I will. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of, the ki of his kingdom forever. This right here is the covenant that God is making with David. This is his promise David, and I really believe David probably is thinking in the moment, okay, about his sons. But what this is saying right here, this gives perspective to us to understand that Jesus was the son of David. This is the covenant that, yes, Solomon's going to come. The Lord held off David from building that house for him, that temple. And David was able to plan it. He was able to get the supplies for it. He was able to finance it eventually. And Solomon was the one to build it. But the ultimate fulfillment of this was the, the true offspring, the one who would come, who would establish his throne forever. This is Jesus Christ, the true and better David. He is the king whose reign reigns forever. Yes, Solomon would build a temple. The temple would be of immense grandeur. It would be the most beautiful building ever built. But this is a foretaste, a picture, a calling that there's going to be one who the entire world will be my temple, where the praise of God will rise up because of him, that one. Do you realize that today you, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you've surrendered your life to him, you've, you've entered into covenant with Jesus, because of his blood, there is no covenant without the shedding of blood. And because you have entered into a promise, a covenant with him, that you are an heir, do you realize that you are a part of the line of David, true Israel, the scripture Romans tells us. You, you are a part of the covenant. He has covenanted with you and he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His kingdom will reign forever. Jesus is the offspring that he speaks of here. All throughout the scriptures, specifically in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, as we've been reading, it's like, have you ever played one of those little games like the connect the dots? 
And like there's all these little dots, and if you move here, you can create a picture, and it's only after you've connected enough dots that you really see it. Listen, God created a covenant with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15 that there would be one who would come who would crush the head of the serpent. In Noah, he again created a covenant that he would never destroy the earth. In Abraham, he told him, listen, by you, one's going to come. By Joseph, he preserved the covenant, the people. Through Moses, he led him back to the promised land. And now here in David, we finally begin to see, oh, there's one who's going to come who's going to reign forever. It is by no coincidence that Matthew chapter 1, the beginning of it, says this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, who is the son of Abraham. Do you begin to see the picture that everything that's happening in Scripture is about Jesus Christ? It is all about him. He is the promised one. And we know, I hope that you know, God never forsakes his covenant. Not because of what we do, but because of his name. He is a promise keeper, not a promise breaker. There is nothing, those of us who have come into his family who are a part of the covenant under his blood, do you realize there's nothing you did to get there so there's nothing you can do to get out of it? You can't get away from it because he keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. Yet we oftentimes, I don't know about you, any of you ever forget? Can you imagine being David and hearing this? I wonder if this promise like was the filter through which he ran everything. Or do you think he forgot about it? I, th I think he probably forgot some things because you're going to see next week what happens when you forget about the covenant. Listen, we know that Jesus always keeps his promises. We know that it, we, we, those of us who are saved, those who have come under, we're assured of our salvation. But isn't it unique that the enemy comes and he whispers in your ear, you're not a child of God. Do you know what you did? Do you remember the way that you, he creates doubts in your mind? And we have to remind, no, I am a child of God. I, he, I've been saved by the blood of Christ. We have to remember that he does not forsake his promises. We know. Matthew chapter 5 says that we'll have everything that we need. But I don't know about you. I oftentimes forget that promise and I start living in scarcity, right? You're trying to hoard some money. You're not, you don't want to be generous because I don't want to, I got to keep mine. What about you want me to help so-and-so give money? Well, that means I may not be able to do when the Scripture tells us. Why do you worry? Why do you fret? Why do you toil? Do you, do you not see the birds of the air and the lilies of the field? How I'll supply all of your needs. We forget his promises. I mean, he's told us that he will be our strength in our time of witness. He says, don't worry about what they say to, what, 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 what to say when you're drugged before officials because I'll give you the words. That would be the same thing. Don't, listen, go share my name to your neighbor. Go share my name to your, to your family. Go share my name to, and yet we're fearful. We know that he's going to be there. He's not going to leave us or forsake us. He's going to give us the words, yet we fear man. We fear being embarrassed. We fear our friendships. But it may create a, a sever in our relationship with our family. Yet we know he will always come through for us because he, it's his covenant. He bought it. He paid for it. He's invited us into it. People of real faith understand that God doesn't break his covenant. The last thing that I want you to see, and I just want to speak a word to you. Number three, people of real faith reflect God's character. Look at verse 14 through 17. The Lord is speaking. He says, I'll be to him a father, your offspring. 
I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, that's how we know. He's talking about his offspring, his son, not Jesus. Jesus didn't commit iniquity. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love, underline, circle, that's his covenant, his unending, unchanging, everlasting love, my covenant. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I, pray, who I put away from before you, David, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever Verse 17, in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Now, if you're not careful, some of this can get mixed up. He's speaking, David, listen, I, I'm going to be a father to your son. And when he commits iniquity, do you notice that? He's, he's not going to be perfect. But be, praise God that though I am a child of his and I do not always do the right things, he does not turn his back because of his steadfast love. Because I'm a child of his, I'm now called to reflect his character, to, to look like him, not to be perfect, but the direction of my life, the consistency of my life. Does that mean that I'm always reflecting the will of the Father? No, but listen, as a follower of Christ, that means that there should be more reflection than less. I should be walking in, in him. Thanks be to God. Romans 8, 1. You hear me say this all the time. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We walk. We reflect the Father's character. How do you know the Father's character? Well, if you are a part of his family, you've believed in God. I have three children, Jordan, Peyton, and Evan. And how is it that they end up doing things like their dad or their mom? How is it that happens? You ever had that happen? You see that in your own kids where you look at them and you go, ooh, I'm so sorry. That came from you, didn't it? <laughs> no, really, it came from me. Do you, you know how that happens? Because they've heard me, they've walked with me, They've heard me teach. They've heard their mom teach. Uh, the scripture says, listen, even when you don't, listen, he's going to commit iniquity, the scripture says, but I will discipline him. Hebrews 12, 6 says that the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. He loves. But that when you discipline a child, they don't become unchild. <laughs> no, they're still ch children. The reason we discipline them. They begin to reflect you. Listen, as we walk and spend time in God's word, as we begin to, God, you are sovereignly in control. I am in a covenant relationship with you. I want to, I believe in you. And so now I receive your word and I want to believe your word and I'm gonna live it out. We begin to look and reflect the character of the covenant God who is in complete control and set us exactly where he desired us. Isn't it amazing? You've probably been in this boat before. I remember being in a situation. Uh, Amy and I were brand new married. Uh, we are off to seminary. Uh, uh, her husband had this bright idea. We're going to move to Fort Worth to go to seminary with no jobs. Neither of us had a job. We were living on love until one day there, were n there was no love in the pantry, okay? No food, no gas. I had to call my parents. I, I don't know what to do. They said, well, meet us at this spot. We went halfway. And we got there. They bought us a great meal. Before I left, they had loaded the car up. They had written a check. That's a piece of paper, you young people. <laughs> no Venmo, nothing of that. They wrote me a check. Even in bad decisions, I, you run to the Father. You run to your... Listen, where you are today, I don't care where you are today, if you're far from him, I need you to know you can turn and run to him. He is there. He loves you. He calls you. 
He wants you to reflect his character. If you've not been in the word with him, today is the day. I, I don't, I, I've got, when my kids call me, I'm like, stop and let's listen. I want to talk to them. Let's, let, whatever it is, let's go. Your heavenly father, I don't care when the last time you talked to him. If it's been a while, get to the word. He will meet you there. He will meet you because he wants you to reflect his character. He wants to pour, he's already poured his love out to you. Today, there are some of you in here, you're not under the covenant. You've never surrendered your life to him. You've never accepted him as your savior. Today, he calls you to do that. And I need you to know, he'll never break a promise to you. His word will always remain true. You can always come to your heavenly father. This, we put faith in the fact that he is always faithful. He will not leave us or forsake us. That's a word for some of you in here who are followers of Christ and you feel like you're, man, I've been living in a far country. Do you realize you can come home? As far away as you feel like you are, do you realize that if you turn around, he's standing right there? Father, I love you and I thank you for today. I thank you for this family and I ask right now, God, would you help us to recognize your sovereign control? You've placed us where you desire us. Father, I I pray right now that you would bring new brothers and sisters into your family. Jesus, we want to reflect your character to the world we live. We live in, we live around, in our family. Call us to your word. Call us to community with one another and with you. For it's in the name of Jesus we ask these things today. Amen.